So now we are with Yu Hong. Uh, Yu is uh, a leading scholar on the issue of digital sovereignty in China. She wrote very inter two very interesting books. Uh, one focuses on the class formation of China. So <laughs> this is not a very common approach uh, to the country. And the second is uh, called Network in China. And it's a dissertation, a very, a very deep dissertation about how the state interacts with market, force, market forces and how the IT sector uh, was developed in, in China. So you, you will have like uh, 30, 35 minutes and then we, mm -hmm. we will prepare some questions to you. The microphone is now on you. Okay, great, Thanks. thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my slide? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, okay. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, digital China uh, through the through the uh, prison of the uh, through the perspective of the geopolitics. Of um, so, so the first part will be about uh, conceptualizing the what what is internet and especially what is post American internet. Um, just looking at these um, slide, you will know that ITU did some uh, recent statistics showing that the internet has become uh, a pretty different thing uh, from 25 years ago when the internet was uh, just uh, pop populated. Okay, uh, we know that the internet has become a dominant medium for global and public communication. Uh, although it is hardly a flattening infrastructure, the topography looks very different today. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, by the by 2019, more than 50% of the world population are online. So, uh, and Africa actually has the biggest uh, number of uh, new subscribers going online. And the uh, uh, United States and Europe continue to lead in terms of penetration rate. And of course, uh, Eastern Asia now uh, makes up the biggest portion proportion of internet users. So given this, I would suggest that the global internet is entering a post-American era. And, and of course, uh, the so-called post-American era must be understood in a dialectical sense. Uh, on the one hand, dominant ideas, uh, interests, and arrangements uh, emanating from the United States continue to matter. Uh, take, take the digital economy, for example. The United States continue to lead and has a significant advantage over the rest of the world. If you look, look at the graph on the, on the left-hand side, um, and uh, uh, of course, here, when we talk about digital economy, we're not just talking about cyberspace where humans interact. Uh, we're actually talking about the internet as a global social technical system, uh, which comprises uh, supranational governance entities, uh, various corporate infrastructures, transnational production, production trains, uh, as well as networked publics. So uh, if we uh, conceptualize internet as such a big, uh, social in, uh, kind of information uh, assemblage, um, social technical assemblage, then we will understand that the United States continue to have great advantage uh, in terms of organizing, programming, and mobilizing transnational capacities. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the so-called the rise of the rest uh, has put in motion uh, political economies shaping and being shaped by, by the global internet. Uh, the rise of the or the rise of emerging countries, including but not limited to China, India, Brazil, Russia, is redefining uh, the global internet landscape through their respective history, political economy, and the social ethnography. So we are really witnessing uh, what Dan Schiller has called a multilateral uh, direction of global digital capitalism. And I think it is uh, especially interesting when EU is putting forward uh, these data protection uh, kind of uh, de uh, uh, de decree uh, in order to kind of rein, rein in uh, Silicon Valley originated uh, uh, tech giants. And uh, so I think uh, EU is making some interesting kind of uh, sovereignty oriented uh, gestures uh, towards digital, global digital capitalism. And India likewise, uh, even though for a long time has been a, a close ally with the United States, but uh, Indian has has been thinking about uh, data localization policies. So, so under underneath uh, digital capitalism, global digital capitalism as a whole, as a global trend, we see uh, growing fracturing 
uh, underneath the, the global, the general global trends. Okay, so um, so so basically, what I uh, so basically what I want to argue is that uh, to some extent, the post-American notion indicates the growing willingness uh, to imagine alternative futures. Uh, in uh, uh, the the example that I already give about the EU, uh, and uh, I think uh, in the case of EU, um, uh, the 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 political entity is proposing. A uh, rights-based cyber sovereignty, uh, you know, uh, but at the same time with a very strong strategic purpose. Uh, likewise, uh, China is indicating uh, diff is uh, imagining alternative futures as well. Um, so, I think uh, even Chinese elites are now looking looking beyond the current world system to craft a post-American world order. Okay, so. Um, and uh, what is interesting is that the United States and China have been engaged in an ongoing dispute over Huawei. And so there is a question about why Huawei, why uh, China suddenly uh, 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 under the scrutiny, why China is suddenly under, um, uh, un under the, uh, in the spotlight. Okay, so what I want to argue is that Huawei basically tells us that globalization that has been going on in the past 40 years actually is a particular form of geopolitics. Um, so globalization does not negate geopolitics. Actually, go geopolitics always uh, define and underline globalization. Um, so uh, in, from the, in the experience of China, we know that uh, during the market reform and opening up, transnational companies from developed countries have, have invested heavily in China. But at the same time, they manage the technological transfer so as to maintain their, their competitive advantage, uh, so as to command the transnational value train and to preserve their competitive uh, advantage. And at the same time, when Huawei uh, kind of uh, venture abroad, uh, Huawei's attempt to enter the US market have been repeatedly sorted from the turn of 21st century. So even though Huawei became the center of the public attention uh, in the past the two years, Huawei actually has suffered a uh, kind of backlash from the United States government for quite a while. Okay, so Huawei's story actually is not a new story. Um, the only thing changed is that Huawei suddenly is under the public scrutiny rather than uh, the state scrutiny. Okay, so I think, uh, so there is a, uh, so I think this is my way to understanding why Huawei became so important. Uh, Actually, it is an important entity. It's an important contender. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the only change is that it becomes part of the public discourse. Okay. And then uh, there's another question. Why geopolitics? Why, uh, if capitalism is always um, kind of uh, accompanied by geopolitical stru uh, struggles, why geopolitics uh, became so rampant uh, in the past few years? Um, so I think uh, for me, uh, this um, world, world system approach uh, to political geography provides some interesting explanation. It shows that the world capitalist system goes through cycles of growth and stagnation. And the phases of stagnation contributes to economic restructuring as well as spatial restructuring. So the old spaces for accumulation will be devalued and a new space of accumulation has to be uh, constructed. And oftentimes, the new space of accumulation uh, would move uh, move to other place, other locations, depending on the state policy, depending on the uh, the provision of infrastructures, depending on uh, other factors. But oftentimes, uh, the hegemony will shift, and uh, the 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 the, sp the, sp the space for accumulation will will also restructure and relocate. So and. Uh, um, so, so what we see is that uh, during the period of stagnation, uh, uh, which is a period where, where we are in, um, political structure, uh, struggles within and between countries will, will heat up uh, in order to capture the most strategic processes, uh, the most strategic um, uh, accumulation processes within, within their borders. Okay, so now uh, we see US and China and other uh, global um, kind of regions are competing for uh, commanding, uh, compete to command the most valuable uh, kind of uh, accumulation processes within their borders. So that's why I think that's why the geopolitics 
becomes so rampant and becomes so kind of visible and uh, and uh, uh, salient. Okay. And the last question I want to uh, kind of ask is why the internet? Why internet moves to the center of geo geopolitics? I think these days the internet not only represent a new uh, economic opportunity, not only represent a new growth pole, uh, but also constitute power. Uh, okay, because internet uh, has moved to a different phase. It is no longer the the uh, in the web one one point one era. We are in a web. 2.5 era maybe uh, so we are entering a post internet era uh, so what constitute internet is no longer just news portals or search engines we are actually witnessing um, the uh, the proliferation of ai technologies of big data of uh, sensors of the internet of things of the internet bodies so therefore i think the internet has become a much stronger uh, tool and a system and ecosystem for for um, integrating information as well as human beings. So our subjectivity can be uh, inf kind of deeply influenced by what is circulating inside of the internet. So therefore, whoever control the global internet will have uh, a strong position in terms of power and in terms of command and in terms of uh, control. Okay, so, so in that sense, internet has become a strategic infrastructure for anyone who wants to have power uh, so in the that's so the so the internet is is part of this geopolitical structure not only because it has economic value but also because it constitutes uh, a very in, important dimension of political power political um, and a geopolitical power so um with all these questions uh we are uh, that I'm uh, trying to answer. So I think we are moving towards a post-American era of the global internet, and therefore uh, it's a question to ask: um, uh, What kind of future we are going to have uh, as a as humankind? And uh, and of course, China is a big variable. It is a big big player moving forward. So therefore, I think it's very important to study digital China, um, not only to understanding China's. Uh, visions, strategies, and approaches, but also to use China as a as a method to understand uh, where the the world is heading to. Okay, so I think um, uh, so so basically, China needs to become uh, a a very important uh, kind of field for global studies. Okay, so uh, given how important China has uh, is and continues to be. Uh, I'm going to focus more on China on on the on the Chinese situation uh, in the sec in the next sec section. So here I'm sharing some uh, old but still relevant stories. Um, so uh, we need to revisit some some of some recent history, um, and we will start with a global economic uh, crisis that broke out ten years ago. And uh, we know that that global economic crisis, uh, which uh, which has been uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, really was a public lesson. It was a public lesson for everyone. Um, and it reveals uh, a longstanding global structural imbalances. And uh, at that time, uh, China basically was labeled as a world factory, right? The country had a high level of saving, a low level of value added, and a low level of residential income. Uh, so in the aftermath of the, uh, of the crisis, the Chinese state realized that the old model has has run its course, and and therefore uh, ruling elites, uh, the state and uh, the public needs to thinking to think about uh, a new developmental model. And uh, so basically, the state showed a lot of determination to shift to shift the uh, to shift the gear to to shift the path. Okay, so since then it has. Uh, show ample determination to move to a to an innovation driven and a consumption based growth model. And in this process, what is interesting is that uh, communications uh, across the entire range, uh, from telecommunications to broadband internet, and uh, from mobile communications to digital media, has occupied a central central position. The state took a slew of actions around communications to create new investment outlets to stimulate in information consumption and to bring about innovation. All these discrete uh, initiatives coalesced into a grand strategy 
of what I call networking China. Okay, so all these activities uh, uh, was not new by that time. Uh, actually, these activities had been going on for, for maybe a decade or two decades. But what is new is that by the time of 2008, they coalesced uh, into a bigger program. And the state seems to uh, realize that communication needs to move to the center of national policy, to move to the center of international relations. So basically, communication um, kind of broke out uh, broke 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 out of a specialized professional uh, arena into a more generalized arena. Okay, so uh, so my research um, for networking China revealed two uh, two important historical lessons. The first historical lesson is a is about varied extent to which states and societies exercise their independent interpretations, uh, even at the peak of neoliberal globalization. And we often forgot that. Uh, when we talk about the past 40, year, 40 years uh, also, we tend to describe uh, the general situation uh, as, uh, as neoliberal globalization, as neoliberalism, as kind of neoliberal, neoliberalism has, be, has been the uh, defining, defining uh, feature for the, for the bygone era. Uh, but we tend to forget that even during the in the depths of neoliberal globalization, uh, non-Western societies and the states uh, actually uh, kept up, kept up their ability uh, for independent inter inter interpretation, uh, which depends on their history, depends on their capacity, and depends on their values. Okay, so to 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 illustrate my point. I'm sharing this picture, uh, which is taken around 2004 to uh, 1994 or 1995. And this picture captures the historical context within which the internet and China uh, find each other. Uh, it was uh, at the end of the Cold War when capitalism became the only game in town. So the United States basically all the, all the world with its techno economic prowess and a futuristic uh, information superhighway concept. So, uh, but at the same time, China just survived an, a series of domestic and international crises. So, so I would say that when China and the internet find each other, it was pretty, uh, it was a humble beginning. And, but 1994 was only a beginning of China's engagement with, uh, with, with, a global, with global capitalism. And, uh, and if we look further back, we will, we will realize that China's story is not that simple. China is not just the follow, it's not just following um, Western steps. China is not just um, converging into the global system. China actually has been a long time uh, contender uh, in the global system, uh, especially if you take China's revolutionary history into account, you will realize that um, achieving kind of national sovereignty is always ha has occupied uh, the Chinese uh, history, um, Chinese national history, uh, achieving national uh, sovereignty is the defining feature, uh, the defining theme uh, for for the twenty first uh, twenty century Chinese history. So, um, so, so basically, uh, since the late nineteen, uh, since the late nineteenth century, when uh, uh, Western China and turn China into a semi-colonial, uh, semi-imperial uh, state. Uh, what China has been doing, including its, its elite, including uh, its publics, has been trying to um, adjusting to the new Eurocentric capitalist system. So this kind of adjustment and uh, struggle has been going on for for more than one hundred for more than one hundred years. And so we need to understand China's behaviors and the motivations in that context. So during Mao's era, um, uh, which is the first uh, 30, uh, 30 years uh, of the, the People's Republic of China, uh, the, the state exercised the socialist sovereignty uh, to build a third front camp, to build a third front project. Uh, the so-called third front project is to uh, ramp up it, uh, heavy and the defense industries in interior provinces. So basically in order to um, uh, kind of prepare for uh, a third world war, okay, so the Chinese leadership basically uh, relocate heavy, heavy industries from coastal areas 
to interior provinces. So therefore, as a result, on the map, we see that interior provinces, which uh, tends to be regarded as uh, backwater regions, actually have very strong um, kind of capacity in terms of uh, micro, micro electronics manufacturing and the research, uh, as well as research activities. So what is interesting is that these all these third front enterprises and the institutions when, went through um, bankruptcy, downsizing, and uh, and restructuring after the Mao's era, after Mao, Mao, Mao's era came to it, to an end. And uh, but still, uh, these enterprises and institutions provide a very important um, kind of uh, talent pool for for the future uh, for, for for future generations. So uh, so we know that. Uh, after Mao's era, China started opening up, um, and uh, microelectronics uh, industry uh, concentrated along the coastal lines. And then many of those enterprises actually drew uh, talents from uh, those bankrupted uh, kind of third front uh, enterprises. Okay, so so in other words, um, uh, Mao's era laid a very important uh, foundation for China's success during the market reform. Okay, even Huawei's CEO, uh, Ren Zhenfei, actually had some kind of ties with third front enterprise um, at, when, when he was very young. Okay, so, so this is what happened during Mao's era. Uh, and uh, even uh, during China's uh, later market reform, uh, the state continues to exercise uh, a bundle of uh, 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 strategies, uh, both uh, open or tested uh, to harness globalization, and uh, and uh, uh, which and this bundle includes um, many different uh, measures, many different measures, uh, which uh, includes um, protecting domestic market, selectively pr protecting domestic market, and uh, supporting homegrown standards, uh, as well as hosting transnational capacities by doing a combination of all of these. Uh, the Chinese state or, chi or China as a country managed to build uh, a dig digital ecosystem in collaboration as well as in competition with the Silicon Valley dominated system. So I think still, uh, even though when chi in, in the past 40 years, China uh, kind of joined uh, mar uh, market, uh, global market and joined the global division of labor and turned it itself into a global um, manufacturer uh, Kind of manufacturing powerhouse, still the state and its people uh, still exercise some so sovereign sovereign uh, sovereignty behaviors. Uh, many of those uh, behaviors or uh, measures were not very successful, uh, but the, the the intention was there. Okay, so so again, uh, so the the first uh, I think the the very important historical lesson that we need to take away is that uh, Western, non-Western states and the societies actually maintained a certain level of independent interpretations, even during the, uh, do, even at the peak of neoliberal globalization. I don't think that China is alone. I think many countries actually uh, are doing similar things, uh, Indian included. Indian, uh, even though being a close tie with the United States, India has a very strong uh, state-sponsored satellite industry. And that satellite industry uh, is a non-profit non -profit, um, and uh, supporting Indian's television system, uh, public television system. So uh, even though Indian is a kind of a, a, a kind of a hard, hard a kind of hardcore supporter of neoliberal policies uh, from uh, emanating from Silicon Valley, still, but Indian, uh, uh, I mean domestically, Indian appears to be much more diverse and have much more have have many different traditions okay so so again i don't think that it's uh on the one hand the past uh globalization is about neoliberalism about a uh, global convergence but still let's not forget about uh kind of local and and the national level of struggles and contentions and the second historical lesson that i want to emphasize is about the analytical necessity to de-abstract uh, the state's relations with various categories of capital. Uh, Western commentaries often render China's internet in the state territorial imagery. 
okay, this is uh, this uh, this um, kind of cover page basically is an example of reifying the state as against uh, individualist democracy or against the market freedom. So it's a example of uh, abstracting the state uh, at reifying the state as if the state is a uh, kind of a uh, static and a pre-given entity, but but history proves uh, proves it wrong. Okay, history actually shows that a much more flexible state, as embedded, uh, being part of or being recursive with economy and society at large. In other words, the state uh, restructure itself, change itself along with uh, economy, along with society, along with the composition of society. So, for example, uh, in in China, China's um, approach to communication, uh, the state actually took a differentiated approach towards global convergence and liberalization, depending on the relative importance of a particular communicative sector. Uh, so, still, uh, so the state basically exercised an uh, overseeing role, okay, and it took some measured approach uh, towards global convergence. And of course, these uh, global uh, these selective and measured approach to global convergence uh, oftentimes uh, is uh, kind of is disorganized, okay? And oftentimes it creates unexpected results, but still there is a, a general pattern of selective and a differentiated uh, pathway towards globalization. And um, so, so this means that we actually need to caution against overstating the power and the unity of, of, a, of the strong state. The state actually is uh, collaborating and at the same time contending with different categories of cap capital. The state needs to work with, work with and against different type of capitals. Okay, there is bureaucratic capital, there's private capital, there is uh, transnational capital. And the state actually has to um, uh, kind of uh, dance with these different categories of capitals. Um, so I don't think that we should uh, camouflage uh, the differentiated and evolving relations between the state and different categories of, of capitals. So uh, what this table is trying to show is, is that uh, the state capital relationship actually vary, uh, 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 um, kind of uh, vary uh, in terms of, uh, in, terms of uh, in terms of sectors. And also it varies uh, along uh, as time goes, okay. So again, um, networking China is a very important uh, project. Uh, uh, it's a very important national project, okay. And uh, and this national effort to restructure China's economy in, is entangled with global restructuring. So um, so basically, what we can expect is that this process will create new social conflicts unexpected power shift and inevitable geopolitical geopolitical and economic struggles uh, but what we want to what we don't want to forget is that uh, the, the reason why China could do this is because China despite the fact that China has made steadfast progress in terms of global digital convergence the state main preserved some crucial um, political economy and ideological foundation for self-determination determination. That's why the Chinese state can still do some uh, kind of self uh, kind of self um, uh, restructuring, okay, uh, in the that in, in uh, amidst a uh, global economic crisis. Okay. So so yeah, so again, I think uh, the nature of the state really matters. And, uh, uh, and oftentimes, when we talk about digital capitalism, or talk about internet, we tend to use uh, we tend to use a liberal model of state to do the analysis. We tend to assume that the state is uh, one is a uh, is a political authority which tries to uh, which tries to kind of uh, uh, suppress individual freedom or suppress market freedom. So there is a reified liberal model of state. But actually, if you uh, look further, you will find alternative theoretical. Uh, resources which provide a different way of conceptualizing the state. So just to give you a, a, a few numbers, uh, a few examples, for example, if you look from uh, from bottom up, the, the last item, the last one 
uh, is about Chinese state, the nature of Chinese state. So there is a theory uh, uh, about Chinese state saying that Chinese state is different from Western liberal democratic states in the sense that the Chinese state really grew up uh, uh, from its experience of organizing uh, guerrilla, uh, guerrilla warfare. So, so in that sense, the state is really embedded in social networks. Uh, the state really uh, kind of became a state by organizing uh, uh, social, social, uh, social, uh, social uh, uh, kind of uh, forces. So the state comes from the society and uh, are part of the society. So instead of using the Western kind of state versus society model, it's more, it's very important to understand that maybe in some non-Western countries, the state is really organically tied up, tied with social um, kind of activities and social energies. Okay, so so there is a different ways to understanding Chinese states. And also, uh, if we you look at the geopolitical uh, geopolitical economy uh, kind of literature, we know that uh, contention and contestation really matters uh, in even in an uh, era of global integration. So uh, non-Western states uh, continues to be contender states and uh, contender states animate uh, capitalist dynamics uh, by not only by participating in the in the global division of, of labor, but also by um, kind of um, contesting uh, the capitalist logic by contesting the capitalist world order. Okay, so so we don't want to forget that there are still contenders. Okay, the con the, the capitalist development is a combined and um, and at the same time uh, uneven uh, model of development. So uh, so. On the one hand, maybe we understood the unevenness well, but we tend to forget that it is also a combined uh, model of development. So, um, so let me talk a little bit about what is new. Um, so, um, so up to recently, uh, the internet and internet-enabled digitization has become unprecedented, unprecedentedly important. So the trend is continuing, okay, from 2008, when communication in general becomes uh, moves, uh, moved front and center in national policy. Um, oh, and this trend continues. And now the, uh, the gravity uh, is, uh, is located at the, uh, at, the, at the arena of internet and digitization. And the whole digital economy now made, made up uh, more than one third of China's GDP. Okay, and so uh, and the internet enables ICT to integrate with all sorts of social economic operations. So really, uh, it has become a, a very important economic space uh, for for China. Okay, and uh, and also on the political front, uh, the the state is um, is making a pledge to uh, to build a strong kind of modern socialist country. Uh, so this political pledge is very important in the sense that the state is emphasizing and uh, uh, is making a, making a stress that China is going to be a socialist state uh, rather than being a quasi-capitalist state. Um, so I think the Chinese state has become more kind of uh, self-confident in terms of uh, making a political um, kind of uh, a commitment. Okay. And, uh, and uh, globally speaking, uh, the Chinese state is facilitating the digital Silk Road project and uh, network investment is a uh, investment priority for China Silk Road Fund, as well as for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Okay, so um, digital technology and communication is part of this uh, effort to redefining what globalization looks like is redefining, is helps, to, uh, I mean, plays a very important role in redefining the contour of globalization. And so here comes some new questions. Um, uh, amidst uh, the global digital depression and, uh, and after China's contested convergence, would digital China move towards a more representative, more representative model of freedom, democracy, security, and development. So I think um, uh, 
so-called digital China is always a global phenomenon in the sense that uh, China um, uh, kind of receive uh, foreign investment and also interact with outside world uh, in terms of cap labor, uh, capital, information, uh, and the technology. So China really is now part of the global. Um, uh, the, the distinction between national and international has long been blurred. Okay, so digital China by itself is a global phenomenon. And uh, so, um, and uh, what is even more important is that uh, digital China has gained momentum. So, so the question has needs to be reframed rather than asking to what extent uh, digital technology will change China. It's, uh, these days, it's more important to ask uh, how would digital China a global digital China will impact uh, relations, resources, and the protocols uh, embodied by the internet inside and outside of the country. And also given how important, uh, how big uh, China as a, con I mean, the, in terms of the scale and the size, uh, we also need to ask to what extent China can contribute to a better uh, kind of future for humankind, okay? Uh, so China needs to make more uh, kind of global public service, okay, uh, for the world community. community. It, so, so it's no longer just the for national interest. It's it, it, its purpose should 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 be uh, kind of oriented towards building a better future for for mankind. Um, so there have been in, uh, kind of new questions uh, being posed by by new developments. So my, uh, my, 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 myself and my collaborators has been uh, trying to answer these questions uh, through a few small projects. So for example, we looked at cyber sovereignty as a keyword, uh, trying to understand what, what does it mean uh, from the point of view of Chinese state uh, by evoking such a notion of cyber sovereignty. Does it, does, does it mean that China wants to uh, balkanize um, kind of uh, the internet? Okay, does it mean that China wa wants to tell apart the global internet? So what do we find in, uh, in terms of our, our uh, kind of uh, official discourse analysis is that uh, cyber sovereignty basically frames sovereignty as a state responsibility for collective rights, uh, but not exactly in terms of going back to the Western Fadian autonomy. Okay, so, uh, so, the, so how the state define sovereignty really to some extent kind of um, faithfully reflect uh, the situation uh, in the sense that the state is no longer the solo authority uh, in the sphere of, of cyberspace. So the state needs to work with uh, multi-stakeholders. Uh, so it's impossible to go back to the Western failing aut autonomy. Uh, so, the, so, uh, in, uh, so this uh, notion of cyber sovereignty is also uh, fine is, um, practices, okay? In terms of practices, the state uh, wants to ba basically build a state-led multilateral, multi-stakeholder model, okay? And uh, another project we did is to look at uh, platform uh, governance, and we want to understand why China managed to build a kind of prosper pro prosperous cyberspace, but at the same time is well known for its control over cyberspace. So we want to uh, kind of address that conundrum. So why chi why uh, Chinese cyberspace appears to be so um, kind of dynamic, uh, energetic, but at the same time we know the state uh, could be could could play a hardball against uh, certain activities online. So we want to uh, uh, answer that question. So what we did is to do a, a social legal uh, uh, kind of um, social legal history. Uh, we want to understand the most important law that support internet development in China. So what we find is this principle uh, called platform immunity. And we traced where platform immunity comes from. And uh, basically it's a Western principle uh, transplanted to China after China joined WTO. And of course, uh, this, this principle uh, went through certain degree of localization and it was being accepted by the legal communities, by the pro-business communities. And uh, this, this principle uh, basically functions as a, as a discursive common carrier, uh, integrating uh, kind of competing uh, 
interest, premises, and ideas uh, that converges um, to the to the platforms. Okay, so basically uh, allowing these competing values to 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 coexist with each other uh, without solving those conflicts. Okay, so uh, so this is one way for us to understand how. Uh, Chinese internet actually is part of the global internet, and uh, and we also trying to answer why Chinese internet uh, could be uh, could be uh, on the one hand uh, controlled, but on the other hand uh, being so active and energetic, and uh, and uh, having so much bottom up kind of participations. And uh, the the uh, the third project we looked at is to look at China's foreign aid in Africa. So. Uh, we had some interesting findings. Uh, what we find most, mo the most interesting finding is that uh, Chinese uh, companies like Huawei ZTE uh, expanded, used their own corporate investment to expand in Africa. And they tend to expand in the most profitable mar national market, like Egypt. Like, um, uh, yeah, Egypt is a, a key national market that Huawei and ZTE expanded. But in terms of the ICT-8, Chinese state provided, they tend to go to uh, countries with lower GDP per capita uh, and a low, a la, kind of fewer population and higher oil rent. So in other words, uh, the state um, foreign aid does not necessarily support uh, Huawei and the ZTE's corporate ambition. Okay, so, so in the case of Africa, we find that the corporate interest and the, the state interest uh, do not necessarily converge, do not necessarily overlap. Okay. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of the ma major part of my, um, uh, what, uh, by my, my, my talk. And, uh, uh, in the end, I'm going to just to say a few words about, uh, about the future to do some speculations looking forward. So what we speculate is that China is going to face, uh, continue to face, um, uh, uh, kind of worsening uh, foreign relation environment, uh, even with Biden uh, uh, elected as the American uh, president, next president for the United States. Uh, I think uh, um, Trump has has made a has made a legacy by changing the narrative about China. Okay, so recently we are um, my student and I are doing a discourse analysis, analyzing Trump Trump administration administration's political uh, kind of narratives. What we find interesting is that uh, basically is a kind of a geopolitical uh, paradigm uh, being uh, kind of crafted by the Trump administration. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and we think that this um, narrative will, 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 will continue, will continue to influence the foreign policy community in the United States. So, uh, so Trump is not necessarily that different from previous president uh, in terms of pol policies. Oftentimes, Trump has uh, kind of inherited and continued. Um, uh, or in, okay, so um, okay, so uh, so in terms of foreign, uh, in terms of the foreign, uh, I mean, international environment, I think. Uh, the situation maybe continue will continue, and also in terms of China's influence, I think we need to uh, break up China as an entity. We need to to understand there are competing actors involved, and uh, increasingly China's social techno artifacts are go going to have global impact. Okay, I think so. That's a very important um, uh, kind of a tie between China and uh, the world. And, if, and also China's relation with the world is also reconfiguring. China is not dealing, not only dealing with North American and Europe, China is also dealing with one belt, one road regions. So the extraterritorial space uh, is, is being reconfigured. And internally, China is also doing a lot of digital spatial fixes in order to boost the economy. So we see the Chinese state is using digital, te digital technology to build new village, new socialist village. So there are a lot of activities going on. So overall, so I want to end with a kind of a more kind of um, optimistic note. Um, and um, yes, um, maybe I can uh, end here and, um, and uh, leave some time for questions.
Hello, you. Uh, was a very interesting explanation. Uh, we, were, we were hoping for <laughs> for these final notes about what to be done, which is the relationship between um, which, which could be the relationship between Spain or the South and China in a more democratic and progressive ways. But uh, we have uh, just a minute for this because we don't have much more time. We have here the, the people translating uh, for these people and it's complicated for them. So uh, let's try to, to, to answer very quickly about this, about how the relations between Spain and China could be in this context, how Spain so leverages his power and his influence in, in Europe uh, not to become a kind of colony as he is now with the United States and to develop his, uh, his internet or his digital economy in the same way that China developed it uh, when he started the collaboration with the, uh, with the US, with Russia, well, before being Russia uh, in the 50s. It's a question, you. Well, it's a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Well. Uh. Well, because I I'm um I don't know that much about Spanish kind of uh, uh Spain's political history. Um. So what I can, what I can reiterate is that uh China's uh partial success. I don't think that China is uh completely successful. China has a lot of problems. Okay. Uh, but China, if China has su succeeded to some extent, uh, uh, part of the reason is because it has a kind of a, a strong state. Uh, the state is strong, not just in terms of, uh, not in terms of controlling its people. I think the state is strong in terms of um, kind of have the capacity to negotiating with transnational cap capital and uh, has certain capacity to harness uh, transnational capital so and also um uh and of course the state is not a uh hom homogeneous entity it has competing bu 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 bureaus like have competing bureaucratic interests right so uh, still uh, despite these um internal kind of um complexity the state oftentimes managed to unify itself uh and and to um kind of uh pit one one unit of capital against other units of capital okay so so i think um so i think it's very uh, i mean looking back uh, i think even though uh i mean uh during the process of market reform maybe the state doesn't have a script about what to do but looking back we do see there is such a logic that the state managed to maintain uh material ideological level of relative uh, autonomy, okay? Uh, without, I mean, on the one hand, it's about uh, kind of emulating Western models, but on the other hand, there are small pockets of uh, space being kept, be being preserved to maintain certain level of autonomy. I think those are very important. So for example, university uh, research institute, uh, institutes, um, they oftentimes, uh, wants to do some kind of independent uh, research and design. Okay, they don't want to like always follow Western, Westerner uh, kind of Western um, te technological trends. They want to build something indigenous. Okay, so there are pockets of uh, space for self self reliance and self uh, uh, self kind of sufficiency. Um, so I think that's that tradition is very important, and that and that tradition really grew up from China's more than 100 year of uh, struggle um, to, to adjust to this Eurocentric uh, kind of world order, okay? So, uh, that, I mean, that mentality uh, is not, uh, has a historical uh, kind of roots. It, it's not something uh, just, just uh, uh, kind of randomly appeared. It has some historical roots, okay? Okay, thank you. It's midnight for you, so we appreciate mm -hmm. your participation mm -hmm. here. Thanks, Michael, too. This was very insightful, and I think we, we thought a bit 
on non non Eurocentric paths to digital sovereignty, and uh, I think the people that listen to us got a bit inspired a bit about this. Thanks for your time. See you. See you soon. Thank you.